Hello everybody, and welcome, I'm Cal Christo. Very briefly, just so you understand, what follows is the content that I had originally recorded in order to make episode one and episode two of the Mayo and Taxes Great Ming World Conquest campaign. I have since decided that doing that World Conquest, which I do very much still intend to do, on the current version of the alpha is not the best idea. I'm sorry about that. Uh, there is, however, still you know, an hour and something of what I consider quite good content. And on the community tab, people voted. They wanted to see the, uh, God, my lungs not very good today, sorry. The people on the community tab voted. They wanted to see the content, even if it was going to be unfinished. So I am going to release the footage. I hope you enjoy. Don't worry, there will be more Mayo and Taxes content coming out soon. And I hope you enjoy seeing me, uh, you know, battling to unify China and experiencing the significant differences in the nature of dealing with the reforms and the estates and the army over in China rather than in Europe for once. More non-European MNT content will be coming, but for now, enjoy. One more thing I actually want to add. If you'd rather watch the full version of the um of this these two episodes uh, it's significantly longer and it is available over on twitch twitch.tv forward slash count christo 42 meaning of life and all that um you would be getting uh only an extra hour of content but like the second episode bit would be kind of four times as long basically uh so if you're interested in seeing more kind of complete version of that along with kind of you know chat interactions and me doing dumbbell reps during the yearly ticks and stuff which is my new get fit strategy so the slower mayo and taxes runs the more my arms will burn <laughs> you can go and watch that thanks for watching and i hope you enjoy the rest of the video hello everybody i am camp christo and the time has come you may recognize this music if you are a long-standing member of the channel. This is the music that I played when I completed what I believe was at least one of the first ever Mayo and Taxes 2.5 World Conquests. I believe one other, or two, maybe two others do exist. This song is deeply ingrained in my mind as a, a great moment of triumph. I played lots of Rome Total War as a kid, and this music meant you'd won a battle. Or maybe even a campaign, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm not going to play this music again until I own everything in the entire world of Mayo and Taxes 3.0. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, today we begin the journey to do it all again. I'm going to do a world conquest in 3.0 with all the new systems, with all of the restrictions on blobbing, with all of the things that are designed to hold you back and make it realistically challenging. I'm not going to let it stop me. We are going to conquer the world. And I'm going to do it from China. China is densely populated, incredibly wealthy, and in certain areas, relatively industrially developed. There's lots of cities. So, we are going to take Ming with their really nice ideas that we'll go over in a minute. And we're going to see what we can do to win the Red Turban Rebellion, Dis unseat Yuan from their position of, of domination over China, which, as you can see, they're already pretty much losing. Unify China, stabilize, and move forwards to great victory. Let's drive into the game, and I will tell you a little bit about our starting situation. All right, here we are. Oh, I left the face cam on. <laughs> Hello, YouTube. <laughs> um, so... Here we are, and I wanted to, to get one thing out of the way right away. I am running three submods. You can find all of them on my workshop, Count Christo's workshop. I'm sure you can find it. They are Mandate of MNT, Ages of MNT, and Christo Gemini. All three of these will make the game slightly easier. And I want to be very upfront about them, because there are those and such as those that would consider them, you know, cheating um, <laughs> through a World Conquest campaign. I don't care about such people's opinions and I think they'll make it more fun. But I want to be upfront and tell you what they are at the beginning. So, first off, we have hegemonies. The numbers are different, um, but we are likely to try and become an economic hegemon, which will give us trade efficiency, monthly raw exhaustion, um, foreign spy duration, set spy detection, as well as autonomy change, mercenary discipline, and urban production efficiency. We could also be a naval one and a military hegemon. Uh, also, 
we have ages of MNT. So the ages system is back. Many of these um, objectives and bonuses are changed slash nerfed to be more appropriate for MNT, but there'll be some bonuses in there, which will be useful for us to have. We also are running a mandate of MNT, which means that the celestial reforms and decrees system is added back into the game, which will create some interesting situations later because this lowers your mandate by 70 <laughs> and being on low mandate is horrendous so that will uh, create some interesting dynamics there welcome to my taxes 3.0 thank you i will just set these up momentarily actually okay yeah these settings all look fine let the game begin um so wimming we're Ming. We have a development of 552. We have 66 urban development right out of the gate, which is pretty cool. Our glorious capital here in Shang Yuan is a 34 development capital. We already have a population of 391,000 people, more than that slightly, living in our capital city. That is pretty impressive. We have a important center of trade, large regional city, all this good stuff. Our obvious early rival is Zhao. If we can subsume, subsume them, we rapidly become the most developed person in the region. If we take a look at the development map, map mode, we have uh, the most concentrated area of development is, is near us in, uh, in this portion of China. If we can unify up, especially if we can unify up this kind of area, we're going to be in a good place. But... Can we do it? It will potentially take a few runs to get everything going. Um, I am by no means an expert at EU4 warfare. I think I'm pretty good at the um, the econ side of things and the, the blobbing side of things, but warfare is definitely not my strong suit, so we'll see what we can do. And of course, Yuan in the north needs their celestial empire taking off them. They don't deserve it. Let's just uh, unmark all of these. Uh, ooh, Assassinate Overlord. What the heck? Uh, army strength is at less than 1% of that, and total development is at least 1% of that. We can assassinate our Overlord. For years, we have been valiant and loyal soldiers. We have fought long and bloody battles against Mongols, thieves, and brigands. However, our glory has risen above them. We should rule under heaven. Okay, that's cool. Unite the Middle Kingdom. We've taken the Forbidden City and destroyed the False Emperors. Once more, the Middle Kingdom will be united and we have the True Dynasty. Holy hell. Okay, so once we take all of China... No, once we take 135 provinces in China, um, we can become the Emperor of China. Ah, okay, this is how you do it. Become the Emperor of China. You lose the Kingdom rank. You get the Empire rank. You get six stability. Holy hell. You enact the Celestial Empire reform. You gain 20 prestige. And you use meritocracy and you can have tributary states. Okay. Uh, you also... Oh my god. You lose 30 corruption and 30 bureaucratic corruption. You gain a core on North China and a permanent claim on North China. Pourquoi? Why would I want both? You also get 10 centralization. You get a succession law event. And you get recently unified China for 50 years. <laughs> Freaking hell. That's crazy. Oh, and we get changed the name to Great Ming. I love it. Okay, that's cool. Um, does it give me a court on the land I own and a claim on the rest? If so, that's we're probably going to have to try and you know get all this land before we press the button because it would be incredibly expensive to core this land. Right, we're in the new... Uh, so, those of you who have been following the France campaign, this will be coming out after the end of the France campaign. Um... We have Aron Alpha 11 now, so there's a bunch of new mechanics, one of which is the option to move our population, but we can't have tenancy-free um, peasantry to do that. Um, what else is new? Ah, oh, yes, we can use this screen, and note, by the way, we're in China, we have a amazing bureaucracy, and we already have career soldiery, free peasantry, enlistment, tax service. It's crazy. We already have a lot of reforms. The clergy only get donations. They are taxpayers, and they are secular. So, I mean, we're in a really, really good place, which is, uh, which is pretty nuts. Uh, we do, however, have an incredibly corrupt bureaucracy, so that's unfortunate. Okay, so yes, we've got ex excellent reforms, and we have this new button, National Military. So, you will note that feudal levies, citizen militia, tribal hosts, zero, zero, zero. <laughs> we are essentially a kind of semi-modern nation-state here in Ming. We have a state-run army, and it's costing us 159 ducats a year. 
that is a lot. That is so much of a lot that it's actually substantially beyond our national income to sustain, I think. Uh, no, we're actually making a profit, but ah, okay, we're currently paying nothing for manpower. We're, of course, on the first day of the game, so it hasn't had a chance to recalculate all of that stuff. And yes, the population in China is uh, truly staggering. So, what I haven't explained yet is how I'm going to be playing and recording this campaign. I'm not going to do it all on camera. If you've been following the France campaign, I explain in detail some of our reasons for this. But in short, this is a campaign I want to be able to play if it's late at night, or if I don't feel very well, or if I'm tired, or whatever. Which means I don't necessarily want to record every instant of the campaign. I want to be free to watch YouTube videos while I do it. It's probably going to take me, I don't know, 150 hours, maybe, to do this World Conquest. Uh, maybe more. Uh, and I don't want to record 150 hours of content. Uh, I apologize to those of you that want to see it all. Some of it will be streamed. And so if you want to watch the full versions of episodes, you can go and watch it on Twitch. But uh, yeah, we're going to do the same style we did for the Mundum Satis campaign. This campaign, by the way, is as of yet unnamed. The name will probably be in the title. <laughs> but if you have any suggestions in chat, do let me know. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to just pause the recording when there's not something very exciting going on. So you're going to get only... The hits, basically. That's the idea. I'll show you major wars, uh, big reforms, big bits of progress, uh, you know, the beginning of our colonial empire, uh, institution stuff, but the, the minutia, less so in this campaign. Fear not, if you really like the long form MT content, there will be another series that will likely run parallel to this one, which will be a standard series where I just record everything. All right, that said, I'm going to take a look to winning this first war, and I don't quite know how it works. In um, in 2.5, when you took land, when you fully occupied an enemy, you just got their your cause. But presumably this is not our war. Oh, no, it is our war, despite us being a uh, military commission. So as a military commission... Oh, that's not very helpful. It doesn't tell me... <laughs> it doesn't tell me the mechanics for what military commissions are allowed to do. Um, can I declare wars? Yes, I can. Can I declare war on anyone or only other military commissions? I can declare war on anyone. Okay, excellent. Um, right, we're also on uh, sorry, EU4 um, 1.33. So there'll be lots of different changes uh, to that as well, which should make the game easier to play. Cause there's been a few quality of life increases between uh, 1.30, which is what we're previously on, and 1.33. So looking forward to that. Also, one more thing I want to highlight two things actually. The idea screen looks a lot better, even though the localization for this one is not working. Uh, this has been improved partly with my feedback, so I'm very happy to see that. And tech. We have uh, a much improved institution screen, and I can actually click on nationalism now, which is nice. Uh, and lots of these tooltips have been enhanced, so this is, uh, this is much improved, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that. All right, I will be back when we see how we can work out what we're going to do about this war. Something I've just noticed. We have Tech 17. <laughs> Look at this. Tech 17. We have the ability to hire cannons straight out of the gate. Well, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I think we should get two cannons and some infantry. But Tech 17, holy Christ. That is that is intense. I think in MNT, and I could be wrong, it kind of makes sense to field your force limit. And then if you run out of manpower, just delete bits of it. Because you get um, you get manpower from disbanding, even though you're at zero, even when you're at zero army tradition. So, but uh, yeah, being a tech seventeen, that's insane. Also, uh, I should point out there's a new system for um, tech costs in this version of MNT. No longer is it just a flat penalty per institution you don't have. Instead, certain techs have certain increased costs from certain institutions. So if you wanted to take Tech 40 with no institutions at all, it starts becoming insanely expensive. <laughs> like 4,000, no, I think it was 13,000 demonic points expensive. Just truly unreasonable. So you need to keep up to date on, on uh, institutions. And commercialism, it's not going to be an immediate goal for me because we need to unify China. But as soon as we've unified China, we need to get our commerce right up. We need to get our urban governance right so that we can do that. And that's going to mean we have to take uh, trade ideas almost immediately. Um, I'd Starting ones, by the way, quantity and bureaucracy, perfect. This is great. I'm very happy to see both of these. Um, the military production is nice, both for just the success of our industry as well as for the costs associated. And our ideas are 
cultural conversion resistance down. I don't know if 10% equates to 10% faster cultural conversion, but that's going to be good. Uh, more tolerance of heretics, which is good. I'm not interested in doing loads of conversions. Um, elite welfare concerns, plus 25%. Now, I don't know if that means they care more about their welfare or they have better welfare, but we'll see. Better monarch admin skill, which means that that plus... <laughs> uh, not that. Plus... This is going to be, we actually get plus two Monarch Advent Spill, which is going to be amazing. Administration cost down, capital infrastructure cost down by 20%. That's so cool. Knowledge output up, institution spread up, conscription mana cost down, diplomats up, diplo relations up, province war score, and admin efficiency. This is an insanely good set of ideas. I contemplated playing as Yuan. Um, they do have a good set themselves especially in terms of the commerce production inefficiency um, and uh, yeah, some of the other stuff in here is nice but Ming blows it out of the water this is an unbelievably good idea set just to complete the kind of country review sadly, no missions I might submod these in but probably not S show me the, c the clo the, oh, the sea love okay, it, says clo it means clove okay <laughs> but anyway, we're um not worrying about missions too much in this one. Right, back to war. Right, uh, it's a new day. I did some more modding, so I thought I would just point that out while this uh, this little war with Ning rages on. So the Empire of China population census now lowers monthly autonomy rather than raising national tax, because national tax is... Um, raising national tax with modifiers is magic money, and we don't like magic money. We also have a production. Mm, that's kind of interesting. Maybe that shouldn't be there either. But anyway, um, you're not really supposed to in, in terms of the MT design philosophy, add modifiers on income because the amount of income you're getting is actually based on the amount of money you've taken off someone, right? So you don't want to add magic money modifiers like um, autonomy change, which means actually I should probably also tweak. I oh, know that's not a uh, that's not a, that's not a money one. I thought this was on tariffs. You can see how I might have thought that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, population census makes sense for autonomy change, right? You know, Doomsday Book being the most famous example of using a, uh, a census to try and reduce local autonomy and enable tax and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, back to the war. Hmm. I don't know why the Age of Discovery is ending. <laughs> That's a little troubling. Uh, it must be a problem with my mod. Uh, if it does end and switch us to Age of Reformation, I'll just manually switch us back. So we, we'll just press on and I'll try and fix that later. Um, I didn't do a peace deal, but I got all the land I had sieged. That's interesting, except this province, <laughs> which I was which I was sieging. And I can't see what event Han just got. I think what I'm gonna do is reload the autosave, play as Han, and see how that event works. Because I want to know I want to know how the unification events work. They appear to have got cores on everything, but I think they already had the cores. Um and yeah, I need to know how the Chinese mechanics work. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into those here for a minute. What? <laughs> I tagged over to players' hand to try and see what event they got that ended this war. They didn't get an event either. It just happened. What? <laughs> I have no idea how that happened. So they didn't, like, choose a, a decision which fired it or anything, because I was playing as them this time. Is it possible Ming got the event this time? Like, if I filter by interesting, Ming set is interesting, right? No, they're not, but... Mm, just event convertings. This, this is just religious events in Ming. So the year of end, end ticks somehow just ends the war? Is it because this battle just ended? That's really weird. What caused that? All right, well, more investigation to be done. Okay, it's a new me. It's a new Chris, though. I could spend hours trying to look into what exactly it was that was causing the uh, annexation event. I assume it's an event. I couldn't find the event to fire. Um, or... Or I could just play the game. <laughs> and you know me, historically, I dig into it and I try and understand it and I just I just don't play the game for a while. But I am going to just play the game. I don't know why that happened. We'll just declare more wars, see what happens. Wish me luck. Never mind me, not read the code. Don't talk such rot. Instead, I'm going to go and read Red Turban.14 <laughs> and then I'll tell you how it works. All right, don't freak out. We're not going to go into the code too much, but here it is. Uh, it's very, very simple. Um, basically, if they are in the Chinese group, the Rao group, Zhao Kun, I don't know how you pronounce this, um, culture group, or they have the country uh, flag, Barbarian Claimant, China, or Mandate of Heaven Claimed, then if you get to 70% war score, they surrender. Uh, and when they surrender, you just annex them. 
So that's how that works. We just have to get to 70 war score, which is actually really good intel. And I'm going to use that to uh, cheese some of these wars because you can get 50 war score from battles extremely, extremely easily. So that's probably what I'm going to go and try and do now once we go back to the real campaign rather than this test one. All right, so almost there on Zhao. Um, but annoyingly, the mod has changed such that all institutions are technically, quote unquote, discovered from the very beginning of the game. Um, to enable the whole invention system. So I'm going to have to change the mod, uh, the Ages of MT mod, such that they just trigger based on years rather than based on specific um, institutions being discovered. Uh, thankfully, one of the MT devs, who's very kind, uh, who I always mispronounce his proper name on Discord, so I'm just going to keep calling him Justice Fighter, is going to patch it. So there's a flag I can have it check instead, which checks whether any provinces actually have the institution in them, which would be good. But for now, I think what I'm probably going to do for the start of this campaign is not actually fix this. It's just use the console to make the ages begin at the right time. But when I have, uh, after this play session, I'll probably go fix that. Boom, there it is. Let's go. We won the siege and then they immediately get the event. And I am happy to see it did not up oh, pause, pause, pause. It did not end the war, which means I can actually annex uh without full calling, which is worth noting, I can actually nick all these guys, which is good. Um Yeah, nice. Okay, look at that. Zhao, boom, we are Probably up there in terms of great powers. Yeah, we're fifth already. In fact, actually, we're second. It just hasn't been calculated yet. Love to see that. I'm going to beeline north, I think, probably. Um, I assume this is pronounced Chi. I'm not sure, though. Because because Q-I-N-G is Qing, the Qing dynasty. So I assume Q-I is, is Qi, but I don't know. I'm going to go with Cha for Qs, even if that's, uh, even if that's wrong. Do correct me if that is wrong. I enjoy using YouTube as an excuse to get better at pronouncing foreign languages, by the way. <laughs> it's a good time. Anyway, we're going to roll north, and uh, we will have... Hmm, it's a city I now own. Should I burn it to the ground? Maybe not. Let's spare them. Good stuff. Yay, it worked. My age triggers are fixed. They're probably localized badly. Oh, no, it looks good. Amazing. All right, back to unifying China. Enough code, more conquest. Hmm, well, it triggered successfully for these guys, but isn't for them these lot? I mean, they're the right culture. I mean, it's the primary culture of me, so it must be the right culture. So I'm not quite sure why that's not firing. Climbing up the power rankings. We are the top-ranked world power, which is great. It's going to give us uh, 25 power projection. We don't have enough rivals, uh, which is a good point. I can't fix that because I'm at war. Um, I'm tempted to just piece this war out. I do want this city. Like, it's a big city, and I don't want to take it because we don't have a core on it. And if I take it, I won't get a core until we uh, unite the Middle Kingdom. Um, which obviously I don't want to do yet. Uh, corruption is coming down, by the way, pretty nicely. Um, yeah, overall, pretty good start, I think. We are uh, by far the most pos uh, populous Chinese nation now. We need to go after um, what I think, again, is Qi, but I think we're going to go after Han Su... Za? <laughs> I don't know how you say that. Um first because they're smaller and then we'll be able to do another big army levy because right now these this guy plus his allies outnumbers us um, and i'd rather not have to like allow ourselves to be sieged down while we knock out the southern lot so i'm going to try and hammer through um yeah Z, su and han first that's the plan i did forget that actually because of the middle kingdom modifiers province has there's a 100 percent local core cost reduction so actually, let's just take them, because then I can get some money off them. We do get a tiny bit of aggressive expansion and stuff, but... Yeah, so the 15% overextension is a lot, but with that core cost reduction... Oh, I just got a core on it. Okay, I guess there's another event that just gives me cores on any land I take. Uh, nice, in the Middle Kingdom, I'm assuming. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Holy crap. So our national army has recalculated. We now have 100 force of it, and that number is only going to rise. <laughs> How much is that costing me? Yeah, 300 ducats. <laughs> 345 more specifically 117 on training 228 on recruitment i love this event by the way this is such a cool number to be able to get all in one place i adore it i adore it i adore it i think it was matty in the mnt team we, we, we have a quick look here yeah pretty sure it was matty was it meeper hang on hang on hang on, hang on. yeah no it was matty so thank you for that it is amazing um um, yeah, I'm a massive fan of that change. We can now actually see our spending. Our books, however, are remaining extremely well balanced. Uh, less well than they were a minute ago, but getting there. Corruption continues to plummet. 
And uh, yeah, we're getting loads of taxes. We are spending quite a lot of points at the moment on taxes. I'm happy to do that while we unify up and then we will uh, adjust as needed. But it's time to build a big freaking army and go and crush uh, Chi, which I think, again, <laughs> still not sure about that whole pronunciation, but we'll get there. Uh, another one bites the dust. All right, looking pretty good. National army is expanding. Looks like we maybe actually will rush this guy because the amount of war score we can get with battles is kind of insane. Although obviously that's only against the uh, the war leader, um, so I'd probably rather use that to annex these guys. But we need to get some more of these before he snipes them. So I'm thinking we're conquering at a ungodly rate. Obviously, um, we should do some reforms. Because when you hurt the relations, you, this this number here, as hopefully most of you know now, if you've been following along my series and stuff, this number here is just the sum of all of um, these numbers, right? So if we piss off the elites in this area, but then conquer this area, and we didn't piss these guys off, that in some part counteracts how annoyed they are over here. So I'm going to do a bunch of reforms uh, as quickly as I can before we finish taking over the rest of China. And I should have been doing this from day one. Um, I think we're going to start with provincial reform because it lowers administration costs. And if you look, a uh, pretty sizable quantity of our expenses are wages. Wages are... Um, so an administration cost is incurred by various modifiers and then, I guess, the development in the province. Maybe it's the number of people, I'm not sure. And you, you quote-unquote pay the administration cost by paying wages to bureaucrats to administer the province, right? So there are various ways you can affect that. One is you can raise and lower wages. You want wages to be high because people are less corrupt when they're better paid, according to my own taxes, which I think is quite funny. But anyway, <laughs> they're, uh, yeah, the better you pay them, the less corrupt they are. And the other way you can affect it is by having lower administration costs, because lower costs, less bureaucrats, less bureaucrats, less pay you need to give to the bureaucrats. So I think I want to do provincial reform, because we get 25% <clears throat> less administration cost, and yearly state reach, and 5% admin efficiency. And I've looked through at the others, I think that is the most advantageous. We also urgently need to increase salaries, but I'm a bit reluctant to do that until we have um, full control of the country. Um, because I don't know what the costs are going to look like, especially administering lots of the kind of outer areas that are going to have likely to have high autonomy and not give us very much money. Um, I mean, there's loads of amazing stuff in here that we're going to reform, because we, we start with just a crazy number of reforms, right? These are all in place. Many of these are already really good, but there's nothing to stop us getting them even better. And I think it's corruption, by the way, follows the same logic as the loyalty. We want to get high corruption reforms done now, because then we're only raising the corruption in this area, not the whole area we're going to control. So I think we're going to do, yeah, we're going to do some of these, and I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to spend a bit of time trying to pick the most optimal one, but we're going to keep pressing ahead and doing some reforms even as we expand out here. All right, there we go. I have got central china unified and now comes the big war because qi is allied to shang hui is that split hui yue i'm not sure and min uh, so this is going to be a bigger war they've got 18,000 24,000 31,000 and 91,000 to my 148,000 and we um that number should rise once we levy taxes on our new western holdings um what i'm going to try and do is declare the war on yue because they're one of the easier ones to knock out. Get a bunch of war score from battles, and then hopefully I can get 20 war score um, from occupations on them. Get us to 70, occupy them. And then what you do is it transfers the war leadership, and I don't know how it picks who to send it to. It might use the old war leadership transfer system, which would send it to the strongest, which would be annoying. But if it doesn't send it to the strongest, which is obviously going to be uh, cheap, then hopefully it'll send it to these guys, and then I'll still have the 50 war score from battles, and I can just do another 20 occupation to get them, 20 occupation to get Min, 20 occupation to get uh, Qi. That's the idea. I can also wear the Imperial Crown, which I'm going to do, because it gives us an Empire title a little bit earlier, as well as um, a little bit of stability increase. Very small, very small bonus, uh, bonuses, but seems like it has no downside. So there you go. We are an Empire. Glorious. All right, things going, yeah, obviously, pretty well so far. We took uh, a little bit of extra time, more than I would have wanted, to win this war here um, because these guys got involved and started sieging stuff down. That was inconvenient, but I think we're still on good 
pace to be able to unify China up. Great Yuan, of course, is uh, losing all their cores in the south and uh, is pretty rubbish and not powerful at all. And they've got zero mandate, so that's pretty good. One thing we are going to have to consider is once we take the mandate, we're going to have a problem because it's going to go down fast um, because of devastation. Um, we live in a slightly devastated subcontinent. And uh, if we just were to take all this land and then immediately take the mandate, we'd be left with massive devastation. So what I think I might do is unify up China, um, but then not unite the Middle Kingdom formally until devastation has gone down a bit. I should also probably leverage the 30 bureaucratic corruption to put us down to like zero rather than just going from kind of 90 to 60 or something like that. But we will see. We will see. So, time to marshal the men for the big war. Oh, well, that's a fortunate turn of events. <clears throat> Yu has broken their alliances, I think, because they became a military commission under uh, Qi. So, we're just going to go to war with Yu and Qi, and that'll be easy. Marvellous. Right, so, number one. It's kind of insane how large the armies I'm already dealing with are. <laughs> we've, uh, we've managed to get the AI to divide themselves up by uh, baiting losing a battle up here and then they started sieging which was good it was all totally intentional definitely didn't just lose a fight against the ai and uh, the choice we have to make is do we start taking these techs with a 60 percent ahead of time penalty because they're going to give me four innovativeness and innovativeness is going to be useful for global institution spread but also bad for unrest and i'm not convinced institution spread is going to be too much of a problem honestly maybe i'm underestimating it but i feel like we're going to be able to develop our homegrown institutions relatively well. Um, I am still very tempted to take these texts, though. We could also unlock a new idea group by taking this one. I need the monarch points for other things, but to get ourselves started off on an innovative foot, I am going to try and be the one that takes them first. We have a level 6 general, so, I mean, uh, rulers is pretty crazy. We've already got bureaucracy and quantity. question now is, what should our third idea group be? One classic obvious option is trade ideas because that will allow us to start getting our, cent our um, commercialization reforms through right of commerce. Um, and that is, in fact, what we're going to do. Coming up later, though, I probably will try and take things like Scholastic and um, maybe uh, yeah, Civic Religion is pretty good. Um, innovative, once it unlocks, is pretty good. Culture is pretty nice. Less nice than it was. Um, but still pretty good. Academic districts make you a lot of money. But yeah, start off, it's got to be trade ideas. Uh, it's kind of the only choice at this stage, I think. Um, sadly, we'll not get any individuals for that, but that is okay. Let's burn through a few of those. All right, cool. Back to a war in. Alrighty then. That's 70%. Whoops. <laughs> Hit space bar and unpause my YouTube video. Uh, that is 70%, which means very shortly you should get annexed. Uh, I'm just dodging some of their armies with some of my, my sieges in the west here. Getting a bunch of sieges won. I have been ignoring attrition on the basis that we're China. Who cares about attrition? And uh, the game is punishing me for that. We have, we've lost like 60,000 manpower in the last year and 109,000 in the war so far. <laughs> so I should probably dial it back on the uh, aggressive um, stuff on that. When are you going to... Yeah, individual war score against Ming is, is 99%. So they should, uh, they should capitulate. I think it calculates at the end of the year, but it seems to, like some of them have happened not at the end of the year. So um, we will have to wait and see. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to save these nine. In fact, you know what? There we go. <laughs> Give me some manpower back. That's fine by me. I'm hoping to not meh, lose that siege, but we're still over 70. So I think at the end of the year, we'll get the annexation. Hey, nice. There's one, and as expected, it has transferred over all of the battle war score, which means that we only have to, uh, I think, wait one more year. It seems like it checks for this yearly. It could be bi-yearly, I'm not sure. And then we'll get these guys. I'm just trying to stop them from looting these cities in the west, um, while also trying not to lose too much manpower in needless fights with the nation we're about to absorb. Hey, hey, forget bi-yearly. It seemed to fire twice. 
uh, in the same little period. So there we go. Glorious victory is mine. Now it's time for um, yeah, Yuan and all that. So mm, here's something I don't know. We can ooh, refresh, request defection to Emperor. What does this do? The Emperor emperor is near. We may defect and acknowledge the Emperor to protect the Middle Kingdom in alliance with the powerful Tru Dynasty. Neighboring country in offensive war against Ming. So if the enemy is at war with us, if someone else attacks us, we can be like, ah, no, Yuan, help. All right, well, we're obviously not doing that. Um, yeah, so Shang, Min, and Qing all need integrating. Qin, I guess, it's not Qing. Um, so we'll go after the south first, because they're allied to each other. Um, and they're under Yuan, but Yuan doesn't get called, because, um, I don't know, I guess they just don't, for military commissions. Um, and then we'll consider what we want to do with Yuan, because I may have to test it. Like, if we kill them before we... Um, before we claim the Empire of China, does the Empire of China just get deleted? Because I can't even do that yet, right? Yeah, we don't quite have enough provinces um, to be able to to do this. And obviously, I don't want the Empire of China to cease existing. So we may have to avoid full annexing Yuan. It's also, I'm not certain it will actually trigger the... I've somehow screwed up this thing, by the way. I think that's my fault. Yeah, their primary culture is Mongol. Um, and I doubt they have the country flag. That means I can full annex them. So it may be that we actually have to um, manually take land off uh, off Yuan. Um, but we'll see. I expect we won't want to directly administrate lots of this land up here um, in the well, and all of this land here basically in the short term. Um, so we'll probably set up a subject up here. I don't have a plan for whether I'm going to try and be finicky with it, like. Making sure, excuse me, hey, hey, hey. making sure that subject is a similar color to us. I do kind of like that. <laughs> That's my new MT restriction. Like subjects have to be a similar color, <laughs> so we can get lots of uh, like Diviet would make a good subject, and Ding would make a good subject. Anyway, um, so we wouldn't want to take too much land from them. Basically, just uh, you know, kind of these states here, I guess. But. Um, Either way, I should be able to get you first, right? Yeah, no cause of spelly though, because we only just got the border, right? Anyway, we can finish unifying up China before I need to worry about that, because this this um this trauma, looking for one of the most ex extreme cases of it, it's gonna take uh you know four hundred and ten months to go away. So that's that's I mean that's a lot. <laughs> Sorry, four hundred and one months, not four hundred and ten, four hundred ninety one. So that's I mean that's a long time. It's years. So we'll have to see. Maybe we can claim the mandate and hold it even with the, the big devastation penalty. I may uh, I may run tests. We'll see. Holy hell. <laughs> so I finally set up the event to actually fire the burden of taxation event. I just realized something. <laughs> Number one, uh, our military power spending is 9.9. .9. Now, I will remind you, the amount that I've told to spend is 30. <laughs> Doesn't that mean that all our taxes... All our conscription taxes are, like, maxed. No, they're barely using it. So why... Why is it... Okay, it's maxed in quite a lot of provinces. What's the easiest way for me to see this? Uh, I guess if I go to buildings and try and build... Ooh, try and build high conscription. So it's got high conscription in all of those provinces. <laughs> and it's costing me nine. Nine! That's insane. That's absolutely insane. We're doing so much. And then medium is active nowhere. And low is active nowhere. You know why it might be? I think it's because I forgot to state everywhere. Yeah, okay. It's literally doing it everywhere that I've stated. Okay, so I need to state the rest of the country and then see if it's going to spend the rest. Because I think we're going to go to like a million manpower <laughs> once I do that. Also worth noting, it's spending all the admin and dip we gave it, which is good. It's only costing us eight dip for our current property maintenance and we're using 10 of it on alcohol exercise sorry excise so if we look at our income breakdown we can see that we currently get about 900 ducats from our property and our excises give us a total of let me just do the maths 186 we get 186 from our excises and the alcohol excise is about three quarters, slightly more, maybe 80% 
of the excise income, assuming we're getting the same amount of income per mana on each of the different salt excise, substance excise, and alcohol excise. That's really interesting. That makes me think we should try and make it so that we own an amount of property that means all of our diplomatic power tax spending is spent on property maintenance and rent dues rather than alcohol excise. Because what are we getting from rent dues even? Not too much, right? Nine, nine ducats? Is that it? <laughs> that's, that's not much. It's not much. Because most of it is coming in from property tax, land tax, inheritance tax. Um, in terms of actual tax revenue. We're getting fees, which are... Um, I'm not actually totally convinced I understand what those are. I think those might be fees on purchases and trade and stuff, but it's mostly coming in from land tax. Land tax, as you can see, on peasantry, that's 640 ducats a year. It's a, it's a huge chunk. But our industry and property are, uh, are a huge chunk. They're almost a third of our income. So what I'm probably going to do is... Um, First off, we're making just staggering quantities of money. So I'm going to cut these these taxation spendings probably. Um, but I'm also going to... Um, I'm going to try and get some property. And I haven't done this yet because I want to probably seize it kind of on a, on a national level. So we don't have loads of property owned in one spot, but more kind of general ownership. Um, but yeah, I'm going to lower it to 15. And then we're probably going to try and seize property up to the amount where the maintenance costs are about 15 or so. I think that will be a, a good way to do it. I'm also going to lower military power spending by 10 because I really don't think we, we need it. And we're only spending 10 at the moment. But once we state everything next year, um, I expect we'll see quite a different breakdown of, ta of um, the kind of disproportionate focus on, obviously, having high conscription in all of these provinces is, is not really a long-term solution. So let's uh, delegate those and see what happens. I forgot, we don't have to wait a year. So I've just redelegated the taxes, and now I suspect it's actually spending all 20. As you can see, the high conscription has gone to a further range, medium in these areas, and low in these areas. So yes, it is the most powerful yet costly of the levies available. What I don't know is, so for example, in our capital, we are, uh, and this is likely to remain our capital, mode, by the way, because I think it's a nice central location um, for communication efficiency purposes. It, there's a temptation <clears throat> to move it down here. Um, to maybe Quanting. Um, does this have a, a natural... It has a minor natural harbour, whereas this place has... Mm, no harbour at all. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, no no major harbour at all. So there is tempting to move it down here, potentially. Um, but we'll think about that. That's a longer-term decision. So, all you know, high levies. That's okay, high, high conscription. That's obviously a crazy... Yeah, you know, that's kind of an intense policy, right? What portion of the people are making it into the army? Is what I want to know. <clears throat> so we've got 480,000 peasants, 400,000 uh, residents living in this province. And the army in this province has yeah, no feudal heavy, no citizens militia, no clan hosts. It's all national army. We're getting, uh, I mean, not a huge, huge portion, right? 3,000. So just looking at peasant conscripts. Actually, no, it's got urban conscripts. It's an easier math. We've got about 3,000. Um, urban conscripts, 2.927 thousand, which is a strange way of phrasing that, but that's fine. It's still, it's pretty clear what it means. 3,000. 3,000 out of 400,000 is, you know, less than, uh, less than 1%. Less than 1% of everyone living in our cities is in our army. 3% military conscription rate, that's not too bad. I mean, I know it's, it's pretty intense, but it's not too bad. I don't think that's going to be enough to really cripple the, um, the productivity of our city if only three percent of the people are being levied into the army but obviously we would like it to be a bit lower uh, autonomy of course in the outer regions is is high and likely to rise um it's no it's actually falling holy hell obviously once we switch over to meritocracy we may see more problems um but yeah we, we the, the fact that we start with all these reforms honestly i'm so glad i decided to do the world congress as china it's just put us in a fantastic position to do really, really well here by starting with an insanely powerful bureaucratic system. Boom. There it is. All right. Almost all of China unified now. Eyeing up Daiviet, of course. Uh, Dali is one titchy little dude over here that we will uh, easily yoink. Position the men to do that. Meanwhile, the rest of the army can mobilize to the northern border we have a bunch more force limit to play with 
as is consistently becoming the case these days. Every time you take a new place, huge more chunk. And with everything restated and re-taxed, we will once again get a massive boost to our manpower, which will be great. Um, again, I think I'm going to do a bit of testing, um, potentially on another save file, maybe, on how the how it works. If we if we annex Great Yuan without taking it from them, or if I can fight them without annexing them and, and things like that, but uh, we will see. Okay, so uh, we happen to be annoyingly at war with them at the same time as uh, Korea, and Korea has occupied these provinces, which means we can't seize them, which does include one urbanized one, so war with Korea is inevitable. Um, but I seem to be able to piece them out, uh, and we can take it for insanely low cost, um, and I think I'll instantly get calls on it all. Um, and if not, we're well, going to do the unified China decision soon anyway. I think I'm going to take war reps and nothing else. I like the prestige. There's no other land we can take from them. Um, but this is probably what we're going to do for now. Uh, let's think about... Do I want to force their religion? Probably not, right? They don't have any meaningful allies. Um, I could end a bunch of their cause. But I think I'm happy to, to end this war quickly. Minimize my um, war exhaustion from attrition and also just deaths. So there we go. Boom. We do not take Empire of China from them because that's one of the options that I did not take. One of the, you know, one of the peace deal options that I didn't take. Oh, crap. Lost the battle. Um, whoops. That's a bit of a screw up. Um, anyway, we're going to be able to uh, expand north pretty easily. Now, it will be a normal uh, CB because show superiority here is not going to allow us to actually take any of this land. Um, it looks like it's locked to um, these regions here, 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 here. Uh, sorry, here. Hmm, how do I take this one? Oh, I guess this one was already owned by um, whoever used to be here um, that we took it from. Uh, so that's how we actually managed to get this province, which otherwise I think would have stayed with them. Um, so we'll have to actually fabricate claims to get some of these. There are some of them that I want. Like there's some urban development up here. Um, I'm gonna. What I'm going to do is really quickly draw my intended... Um, northeastern border uh, on here just i think that'd be fun and then beyond that we'll probably just have one big um probably tribal vassal that just holds a lot of this land for us honestly maybe from now until nearly the end of the game um because there's the the getting the communication efficiency up here the tribes have bonuses for it i don't know if uh Johan does actually but uh some of the tribes have bonuses for for communication efficiency on step we do not um so it's just you know, i'm gonna draw that border now like that, basically. And I'm not totally convinced on whether we take uh, Inner Mongolia. But the thing is, because the state extends all the way down here, so it would look kind of janky if we didn't. The alternative, of course, is we actually just stop here and don't take any of that land, um, which might be neater, honestly, now I look at it. The downside of doing that is there is a nice big city here, which I would like to have under, under our control. Uh, three levels of amenities, already got important centers of trade. You know, there's some, uh, you know, some decent sized urban industry going on here. Not huge, but but some. Uh, so I think we would like control of that, um, partly so that our Eastern Siberia trade sector score is higher. So I think I am going to take this in the fullness of time, but I'm not in a tearing hurry. Um, we're probably going to focus on Korea first. Um, our long-term expansion goals, well, well no, I'll, I'll speak to those when we when we have actually finished unifying China, and then we can... Uh, I can lay out some of my theories. I have no idea how much I'm going to stick to my theories, of course, because, you know, I haven't played Ming in 3.0, so I have no idea what's going to happen now, basically. And there it is. Don't worry about this event. <laughs> it's bugged. Um, so these are the last two provinces in China that we need to take. Boom. There it is. A unified Chinese subcontinent, with the notable exception of <laughs> these three darn provinces, Korea siege down and then didn't even have the decency to take, but oh well. Um, so I could press this button. And I'm going to experiment with it because we have quite high bureaucratic corruption right now, which means it's trending down. I've been continuing to do reforms and things. Um, I think the latest one I did was uh, increasing the, uh, the official wages a little bit, which will, of course, cut into my bottom line. Yep, there you go. Wages skyrocketing already. Um, but we're still making a uh, a tiny bit of money. But yeah, we need to desperately not let wages uh, get any higher. And we need to urgently decrease corruption because it's extremely expensive. Um, I've also noticed that um, we are now spending 
all of our um, all of the diplo points on property maintenance now that we've actually fleshed it out to uh, to include all of these new wonderful provinces that we've recently integrated into the empire. Um, but I think this this, sorry, this event is annoying me. Let me let me finish this spiel once I've got rid of this event. <laughs> Okay, so, as I was saying, <clears throat> as if I'm just carrying on a conversation when I got rid of an event rather than having had dinner since I last spoke to you, but anyway, as I was saying, we have unified all of China, and it's time to start thinking about our outward expansion. To the purpose of this great goal, I have built 60 transport ships, which may give you some indication of what my plans are. I think there are a few essential steps to do in this world conquest to set the right foundation for us to begin expanding uh, one of them is we have to embrace commercialism and we have to do it as a matter of urgency in order to do that urban governance has to not be three and commerce right has to be eight or higher we can start going towards eight once we unlock the right of commerce which we are pretty much beelining <clears throat> and then i will start raising up this um stat here which is going to require me to support the metropolitan estates a bunch uh, because they're not powerful enough we're going to need to align the cabinets with them a bunch it's going to cost us um all kinds of problems um but we're going to do what we can do <clears throat> see what we can do rather to try and support the burgers as much as we can um, that's step one step two is i need to um establish a, a solid income base Obviously, we're already making loads of money. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there is a lot more to be made. One, by getting way lower corruption, and we're going to keep reforming the administration. I think the, the appropriate approach is to try and hard reform the administration early. <clears throat> and the logic behind that is, I want to stop. I want to be able to stop reforming the administration because I want it to be done. So we're going to push towards getting all of the reforms we want, getting rid of all of the noble privileges, and... Um, getting the bureaucracy fully, not fully, because I, I realized, by the way, um, one thing we definitely don't want to increase too much more is wages. Our wages went up quite dramatically, um, not unsurprisingly. I took away a minus 80% modifier and replaced it by the minus 60%, so you know we doubled the wages. Uh, we're not going to increase wages too much, too, too much more than that. But what I am going to do is try and get basically all the rest of these reforms passed as soon as possible. Uh, that will allow us to have a um, really solid base from which to expand on. And once we've done that, I'm going to try and crush our, uh, our corruption. But there is one step I can take right now to crush that corruption, which is to unite the Middle Kingdom, which I am going to do now. Um, I am going to save first um, because I don't know what it's going to, you know, it might break or whatever. But... Uh, we're going to do that. At the end of the very first episode, we're going to unite the Middle Kingdom. By the way, um, I'm playing, uh, what's it called? Bronze Man. So we're not going to reload unless we needed to like test something or, or make sure a mechanic works or whatever. I'm obviously not going to play actual Iron Man because it will, you know, it's, the mod requires tweaking occasionally. Um, so we have all of this area owned except for these three provinces. Um, if we have to core these three provinces, it's not the end of the world. Um, I mean, it's annoying, but uh, what would it cost us? 191 admin power, oh my god. Hopefully it would be actually less than that. But um, I suspect we might still have the Unified China CB. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe I shouldn't maybe I shouldn't declare this war, actually. It's Unified China, though, right? It's not claim the Mandate of Heaven or whatever. But yes, we are Ming, Yuan has been banished to the steppe, and we are ready to unite the Middle Kingdom. We gain 6 stability and 20 prestige. Ah, so I should actually definitely try and lose some more stability first. Is there any way I can do that? <laughs> Hang on. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about something else. You know what I did not lose at all? These higher levels require one of the following. Trade ideas, bureaucracy ideas, or bureaucracy burger average power but then they all also require metropolitan influence so we actually didn't need to take trade ideas which is kind of annoying because now i'm going to get crap tons of merchants that i don't need <laughs> commerce production and efficiency down is good that's kind of it that's the only useful thing in here 
that's kind of annoying. Um, I'm tempted to abandon this idea group and just raise the uh, the burger's influence instead. I think we don't abandon it now, but in the future when I have a surplus of some kind of monarch point, I'm going to abandon this and replace it because we need evangelical ideas urgently for Empire of Truth. Empire of Truth is going to give us a CB on essentially everyone in the world. Um, we need scholastic ideas, I need civil religion ideas, I want administrative ideas. There's lots of stuff we need, and if we can get commercialism the other way, but because commercialism is such a high priority, I am going to keep trade ideas for now um, and, and put extra points into it. I have found two ways to lower my stability. By the way, we're going to um, support the burgers uh, by aligning the cabinet. It's going to cost us one stability um, and also give them some more power, which is actually a good thing, I think, um, because I, need to, I want to try and empower and enrich the burgers a bit, get some industrialization going with, uh, you know, local money. Um, and we're also going to reform the administration by um, doing this one, by lowering the elite power from autonomy, which will help weaken the nobility. Um, but it will cost us a stability, which should be good. And actually, I can do that right now. I've just realized. <laughs> I was waiting until I'd saved up enough that I could afford to do that. It's one provincial corruption. The other one I was considering was... Yeah, so we actually... Our state reach has dropped just because the state reach here was higher than the state reach in, you know, the rest of the country. So we are going to have to raise the state reach up back uh, up, back up again, but that's okay. So yes, we will facilitate open recruitment for examinations, which means... Uh, you know, hiring people less because of birth, but more because of talents, which of course destabilizes the country. And then we will support the burghers by aligning the cabinet, which gives us relations with them. They get more power. We get worse stability increase interval, and we also lose some stability. And now we unite the Middle Kingdom. Ming becomes the empire, emperor of China. We enact celestial empire. Oh, it's true. We haven't actually looked at our government reforms yet. What have we got? Dynastic does nothing. Primary spouse has... Okay, we have consorts. Sorry, this does do something. Dynastic, enact, harem, and prisoner. Yeah, 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 has consorts, harem, fixed dynasty. Cool. We have office, which does nothing. We have uh, assemblies, which are irrelevant to us. We have unitary, which lowers um, diplomatic annexation costs rather than giving us income and force notes from vassals, which is good. We haven't selected a tier of devotion, but these do nothing at the moment, pretty sure. Um... I believe they, I've been told anyway, that they're, they're needed for one particular reform, so maybe that'll become relevant. Autonomy is a ban, so we can uh, we can integrate people. Provincial leadership, don't think this does anything. We have a fully centralized military, which means we get yearly army professionalism. That is indeed applying. This is ticking on up. And we have, yeah, no special arrangements, but we're about to get one because, huzzah, after only, I don't know, what, like four or five hours probably, our on camera, we unite the Middle Kingdom. Boom. And we get all kinds of events. <laughs> so, oh, I disinherited our heir, by the way, and went up to level three advisors as well. Um, so we start with 60 meritocracy and 100 mandate, which is actually going up because we have the plus two recently unified China. Um, the recently unified China is a very nice modifier, including 50% stability increase interval, and it lasts for 50 whole years. So that should see us through our devastation period. We also get an even sexier map color, I believe, and the new fancy name, Great Ming. You love to see it. We can also compile a dynastic history. Uh, the event compiling a history of blank happens in 15 to 20 days. Uh, cool. Um, and yeah, restoration of the tribute and the succession law. So I'm going to read into these before I pick because they're... Um, they're kind of a big deal. Okay, so basically what it looks like, this is, do we offer our neighbors, not you and the others, to become a tributary of us or not? If we do, we hate Yuan. If we don't, we lose prestige. I think that's fine to do. I have no interest in immediately conquering these guys. I'll talk about expansion um, ideas in a minute, but yes, we will follow tradition. And succession law, do we want to have consorts? Um, basically, do we want to have a harem? Or not. The advantage of a harem is you can pick an heir. The disadvantage is there's you know, some harem events. Um, there's various different things that can go wrong, but I think having a harem is going to be really good because it will allow us to pick an heir, um, which means we'll be able to get better stats. So we're going to go with appointing an heir is best, which will enact the um, yeah primary spouse, harem and primary spouse. Excuse me. I thought I was going to get harem and primary spouse. 
Ah, oh, but this one. Enact Hiram and Primary Spouse. Yes, this has not enacted Hiram and Primary Spouse. That's weird. Um, maybe it will correct on the monthly tick. Let's uh, let's find out. Uh, oh yeah, we have a new decision. The dynastic history. Well, I'm not going to spend 200 admin on that before I figure out what it does. Also, we can enact decrees. So our meritocracy is going up. Um, we have positive mandate, which helps it. We have power projection, and we have faction support. So faction support comes from um, loyalty of factions. I'm surprised it's so positive, actually. I'm not exactly sure why we're getting such a positive amount from that, but uh, yeah, I mean, don't complain. And we also, of course, have access to the Empire of China mechanics. So these are ones that I've modded, sub-modded in. We can get core creation costs down, autonomy change down, provincial trade power, ship durability, fort defense, or infantry combat. Each of them costs us 20 meritocracy, and you get it for 10 years. So basically, you spend two meritocracy a year in order to get one of these things. We're only gaining under two a year, so I'm going to let meritocracy rise to 100 before we actually uh, fire off any of these. Then we have the reforms, and these are all really good. I've heavily nerfed the last one. The last one used to let you turn... Um, tributaries into vassals which is uh, just too powerful I think so I've taken that out I've nerfed a bunch of the other ones as well but what the problem is is when we enact these I can't remember if there's a dialogue when I click on them uh, but when we enact them our mandate goes from 100 to 70 uh, sorry to 30 and takes off 70 which is going to give us some serious negative penalties but I think it makes sense to try and pass some of these while we're in the recent uni recently unified China kind of grace period, because once that's worn off, it's going to be really hard for us to get positive mandate growth. You basically need to do it from uh, large tributaries is, is one of the main ways. So I am going to do this immediately um, and get some extra yearly meritocracy. It does have a pop-up, right? Annoyingly, it does cost us a stability when we've just gone up to three, but it's got to be done. So you'll see here we immediately get four unrest, 40 stability increase interval, minus 10 morale of armies, fort defense, every, all kinds of stuff. Um, including mandate growth modifier, which is why it's uh, why, one of the reasons why it's so penalizing. It can become a snowball. But if we can get rid of that devastation, which obviously will just happen over time, as well as the recent unified modifier helping. Um, I have deleted all my forts, which it now occurs to me might have been a bad idea. Um, oh no, forts don't reduce, uh, don't reduce trauma in the mod. Okay, cool. But yeah, I've, I've torn down the forts all over the central section of China because I don't expect to have to fight any wars that are at all difficult, basically, from here on out in terms of us actually getting sieged. And yeah, I don't want to do any of these, so I will get rid of that alert. Okay, that's some internal politicking going on. The other thing I'm going to do off camera is look around, pick basically one, one or two cities per state, and I'm going to try and start developing a little bit of uh, urban development there. I'm going to um, open a whole host of new industries, mostly higher education in basically every city in the country, in order to try and move us towards uh, yeah, getting better education output. It's a good trade good, and um, it will help with later institutions as well. So let's talk about conquest. I have no idea how difficult this is going to be. I don't know what pace I need to maintain. I don't know what kind of level of world conquest we need to be at by 1600 to be on pe to you know to be on on track to succeed. I just don't know. So what we're going to do is we're not going to try and play at breakneck pace from immediately, right? Because I think I would push myself. Oh hey, we got cause. That's interesting. Cause on that one and claims on this one. I wonder why only on some of them. Is it because they were currently coring this one? Seems unlikely, right? Anyway, um we're going to try and grow relatively quickly and also just enjoy the game. We just know that our end goal is try and conquer everything. So what's step one for trying to conquer everything? It's build a rock solid economy. Number one, open a bunch of industries. Number two, activate the auto investor. I've done that. We're putting 10% of our income into the auto investor every year. 10% of our treasury, sorry. Now, um, beyond that, we need access to more trade markets. I need the ability to connect to new nodes. In order to do that, I need a series of trade provinces. So what I'm going to do is try and engineer myself into a position where essentially I have conquered a whole chain of provinces that give me access to all of the markets in the known world. We're also going to be taking um, exploration ideas at some point. Uh, I forget when we can take it. Uh, I don't think it's actually said in here exactly as if it, something like at Tech 23. We should be able to get it, which will sync up relatively nicely with either our 22 or our 26 slot. Um, 
and yeah, we're going to take expansion, um, sorry, exploration, so that we can find um, the Americas. We can get our Colombian imports institution on, on lock and all that good stuff. So yes, we're going to seek out basically a couple of trade ports around the world, and we're going to try and take cities, um, you know, existing existing large cities. But I don't want to be spending a huge amount of monarch points on. Um, so annoying that you can so easily close that screen by mistake. Um, I don't want to be spending a huge amount of monarch points on coring. So we're just going to take very isolated cities around the world, and they're going to function as little trade ports, basically. They're going to enable us to um, have access to the market, have a decent sector score within the market, which is based on a large local commercial um, uh, industry, and various other things as well. And then we'll be able to have access to a big market. Why do we want access to a big market? It's because that means we can buy and sell goods at more favorable prices. It is never bad for your nation to have access to a larger market in the game. And then there are the actual land conquest goals. And I'm not going to be conquering too much too fast because I want to spend my administrative points as far as is sensible reforming at a breakneck pace. I'm going to try and keep corruption... Excuse me, why is my, why is my bureaucratic corruption 78%? I don't think I don't think that's right. Yes, there we go. Okay, Whoa, that worried me for a second there. Uh, it was seventy-eight percent before the reforming, uh, the uh, claiming the mandate. Um, so we're going to try and keep our corruption below. I don't know, sixty percent, probably about sixty percent. And the reasoning there, of course, is I just I need money continuing to flow into the treasury rather than into the pockets of corrupt bureaucrats because I want to be able to keep investing it and building up the industry base. But I also want to be able to have the admin points ready for the commoner interactions, for the direct the bureaucracy um, interactions, in order to keep powering through getting a lot of those um, a lot of those reforms passed quickly. Because again, we want to try and pass all the reforms, be done, and then just expand from there and not have to worry about it. But those admin points that I do have, that I do feel are in surplus. This is our initial northern conquest expansion goals. We will, of course, also try and conquer Japan. Japan's conquest will be much easier when it is piecemeal, I think. Um, getting a, a large trade company established over in Nippon will be good. Can we set up trade companies? What's the rules on that now? They can only be traded in, in territories is one concern. That's true. Um, but we should be able to make them... Um, I have already set everywhere to a trade company but uh, sorry to a state but uh, yeah we should be able to make a trade company in um over here we're going to need some trade companies early on to try and get the merchants we need to get access to all of these different nodes at once uh, in the fullness of time that will not be a big deal at all um because we will have all of the uh all of the tra uh, tra merchants we could possibly want just from our local centers of trade which will continue to increase as we go forwards that in short is the plan. Thank you so very much for watching this first episode of our World Conquest, which I still haven't come up with a name, but I will have done before I upload the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you all in the next episode where we will start our expansion outside of China. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Count Christo and this is our glorious World of Conquest as Great Ming. We are in the process of centralizing after having just fought you know, the Red Turban Rebellion and reunified the whole country under our control. We are looking to reform our bureaucracy and expand out into the world. In the short term, these are our conquest goals, but there is much more than that to be done, including grabbing trade ports in the south, and we're going to move towards that now. All right, so we're talking about tributaries and looking about their value. Um, we've also had an event fire that gave us another stability and some mandates, so that's nice. And it's also, yeah, trending up pretty fast. But we got Korea, uh, Daviet, Lang Zhang, I think you say Zhang for X, and Anding as tributaries. And we found out we actually can get monarch points from them. And it looks like you get about one monarch point for every 80 development or so, maybe 75. That seems overpowered to me. So I think I'm not going to use these. I think I'm just going to use cash still. But we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I think that's a bit overpowered. So we're probably going to stick with cash. Um, manpower, I think, is also permissible. Ah, oh, but you can't take manpower from them. Okay, cool. 
Um, but yeah, I think taking more points from them would, be, would just be very overpowered. Um, so instead, we're going to take cash. But the reason we want these tributaries is because, as you should be able to see in here now, yeah, we're getting 0 0.08 from tributaries. It's something like one per... 100 development in tributaries basically so we want to take little noodly appendages out into the world so this is the first province that i'm going to target um we need to take little provinces out into the world which let us um touch more nations because you need to be in direct contact with a nation in order to make them a tributary ah and there is the force tributary state cb does that allow us to take land 50 percent express expansion and 50% cost for the conquest of provinces. That is so powerful. Can I use this on anyone? Who can I use the fourth tributary state CB on? Because that is, I mean, that's kind of mental. Can I just use it on anyone I border? We don't, we don't need to take religious ideas if that's the case. That would be, that would be nuts. All right, you guys, come on over here. <clears throat> Change of plan, we're going to war immediately. I know I said we were going to have time of peace, but I see a lot of things. I say I'm going to do this as a world conquest. <laughs> Who knows if that will come true. The rest of you can stay near the northern border. Tribute state foolishly broken. Okay, so we might actually struggle with tributaries if they're going to be this disloyal. You cannot take provinces with it? You sure? Oh, the following options are disabled. I misread that. Thank you. Okay, okay. Well, that could be... All right, we do need to take religious ideas then. Hmm. The fact that they just immediately broke off. Oh, it's because they don't border us. Of course, of course. So, okay, so we should be able to make them stay as long as they are threatened rather than disloyal. And they're likely to stay threatened forever. We can also give them kind of quite piffling gifts to lower this. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to see how this war goes and let's see what we can do with this, uh, with this war goal. All right. That's not a great development. Diviet just broke our tributary status. Are we actually going to lose mandate for not having tributaries? Like in vanilla? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay. But they're willing to... Ex That's kind of busted, isn't it? They're willing to accept take it. Did it say it in Vorstra, which was disabled? No, surely not. The following peace options are disabled in forced tributary state. What? What am I allowed to do then? <laughs> <laughs> seems seems odd. Um, <clears throat> also, I didn't mean to improve relations with Mongolis elements. Spy on them. All right. Well, we might have to do some modding. Um, they obviously shouldn't accept tributary status if they're not willing to be a tributary. Because, like, I mean, welcome back, Daviet. <laughs> Why are they so unhappy? Just because they have too high development, basically. That's kind of ridiculous. Conquests and reconquests. Yep, that makes sense. It's kind of ridiculous that they would um, break away immediately. And that's, I mean, that's an insane amount of liberty desire from being a tributary. We could make it so that tributaries don't have a liberty desire from development. Would that be overpowered? We'd still have to get them. Do you think that would be broken, chat? I mean, it would it would make it easier for sure, but it would also kind of... I feel like it would kind of make it sane as well, if that makes sense. Because obviously we can't be in a situation where they just break off repeatedly. High mandate should reduce liberty desire by a lot. Hmm, maybe it does. Liberty desire in same continent subjects minus 25%. And Diplo Rep plus 3. And Liberty Desire and Subjects minus 60%. Okay, that's how you're meant to handle it. That's how you're meant to handle it. Okay, well that's fine. That makes perfect sense. We will do that. I appreciate the tip. There are de ideas to lower Liberty Desire. And um, there's also age bonuses we can get. Diplomatic ideas is... Yeah, obviously, two, two Diplo Rep is, is that by any other name. I think Espionage does it? Yeah, Liberty Zone subjects minus 10, but that's not it's not huge, is it? Um, and then I think eminence ideas that you unlock. <clears throat> Influence and eminence. We are probably going to take diplomacy because I want empire. Uh, 
uh, it's not going to be very useful to us. Well, the province of Warsaw is useful, but yeah, high mandate is gonna should crush it. I thought I thought we were just doomed forever. Like I was gonna have to go back to modding, <laughs> but um, yeah, we're obviously not gonna have this low mandate very much. I don't know how regularly you can do a reform. And yeah, that's them all refusing to pay me my tributaries, and it's yearly tick time. Can I zoom in on my chat? Participants. No. Timestamps, feedback. Don't really need any of that. I'm sure there is a way for me to zoom in on this. Hey, not too bad a yearly tick. So yeah, we're currently spending 20 on mill, 20 on dip, and 14 on admin. Investment. <clears throat> so it's invested... Wow, it's invested a 1,000... All in this province, huh? <laughs> it's put 1,300 ducats into this province in forestry. Okay. Seems seems good. Forestry industry is pretty profitable here. That's quite a lot of money to spend on it all at once. How much room is there for more forestry? A lot. A lot. Fair enough. How much do we own already? 7%? And that's probably before this investment, I have to imagine. Pretty good. Oh, yeah. Hydrate on the yearly tick for sure. Show another province that just got invested. Oh, okay, it did spread it around a bit. <clears throat> Yang Zhao put it into forestry, extraction, and agriculture. Cool. I like seeing. I like seeing these things. I'm not going to keep this up for sh for for long for sure. But uh, click the social cycle to another selected province, even if no investment has happened. Why would you want that? Damning another 1,300 invested up here. I think we're doing 50% of our income every five years. Tezao, more, more extraction. Oh, some industrial investment, though. Oh, I misread this entirely. It invested 0 0.37, 336 ducats in the province, not 1,369. That's the year that it did it. Okay, so it's really investing very small amounts all over the country. Okay, that's more what I, what I kind of hoped it would do. Let's turn off, um, let's turn off the pop-ups, though. Uh, yeah, stop notification. We're doing 50% every five years, so 10% of our treasury every year. Now, here's a spreadsheet <laughs> that I haven't made, that I'm not going to make right now. Oh, I'm live on YouTube still. I didn't mean to... I meant to pause the recording. Sorry, YouTube. I might edit this out, but I might not. All right, YouTube. Oh, I didn't turn the face cam off again. <laughs> it's time for our first commercialism reform. Boom. The reforms of 1379, 71, sorry. We are pushing, remember, towards getting these reforms done because we need to unlock commercialism, which requires at least a commerce right of eight. So, reforming the realm is an arduous task. We get indifferent aristocrats, ecstatic burgers. We get plus four burger loyalty, plus 60 relations. We lose one stability. Ooh, we lose meritocracy and mandate in order to do this. That's interesting. We need to keep that in mind. We also get uh, societal instability for five years and... Uh, well, six years, actually. It's an interesting number to use. And um, all power costs up. No problem. And the burgers will be so happy that I should actually lower their happiness. Otherwise, we're missing out on happiness here. Can I... I want to do one of these that doesn't hurt them. Restrict foreign trade. Land reform. I don't actually want to do any of these. I think the burgers are just going to be unbelievably happy with me for, for the next little while. A great success. We have done commerce. Good stuff. So in case you weren't familiar, what we just did is went from state commerce to guided exchange. So we're moving away from like a centrally planned economy, basically. And a um, it's made us have <clears throat> higher ideal burger size, which means we're going to have more power for the burgers. And our commerce production goes up and our merchants from trade centers also goes up. And it means that less of the burger commerce income gets given to the state. And then we're going to go all the way up to here, at which point very little of it goes to us. And you actually get bonuses to commerce production and uh, an ideal size. So that'll be good. And if I refire this, it should recalculate their loyalty up to 96%. Fantastic. That is what I like to see. All right. So obviously that did lower our mandate down a little bit, but it's still going up. How long do I have on my recently claimed mandate? Because the problem is we need this we need the devastation in the country to, to go down. Because if it doesn't, once this 
modifier expires for recently reunified China, we're kind of screwed. We have got 50 years before we need to actually worry about that. Okay, uh, war exhaustion is still relatively high, but these guys seem to not have any sieges going on right now, so I will choose this moment <clears throat> to charge in here. I just want to see what this does and what we can do with the uh, with the CB, what, how much aggressive expansion it causes, if any. You're allied to Ayutthaya, so I'm not going to full call you. Um, we should, no, we should just stay at peace. Just stay at peace for a minute. We should let our war exhaustion go down, I think. And once again, I forgot to pause YouTube. Sorry, YouTube. <laughs> so YouTube, once again, I've left the face cam on, but I know some of you don't mind it, but I just don't like face cam on YouTube videos. Um, I've discovered that we can do these reforms with no cooldown. So we're actually going to try and burn through as many of them as possible in the first 50 years, which will be good. And then also... I've looked at the amount of trauma we have going on, and it's going to take about 50 years for the trauma in this province to go away, which is exactly the length of time we have the bonus from recently unified China. So that that really kind of works out quite nicely. Um, we're also working on trying to get tributaries to actually stray tributaries because they hate us when we have low mandate, but now our mandate is going up again. Thing is, maybe I should reform it again. I think I'm going to let it go all the way to 100 before I reform, just so we never end up lower than 30. But in the meantime, I might as well try and set up some, some tributaries again. Hey chat, maybe I'll just leave the blooming face cam on, I don't know. We're in the process of... Um, no, I don't want to. We're in the process of working on a project to build better capital infrastructure. I've just noticed. It gives better communication efficiency and CE reduction, which we knew about. But it also gives prestige and yearly centralization in the capital. That's really cool. I like that change. Um, but yeah, we're, gonna, we've, we're funding 50% of the upkeep on this capital and we're also going to take it to level well what would it cost to take level four uh, with with two extra units just for a bit of safety padding it's going to cost 1959 i think that's a good first infrastructure project we'll look around about other ones one other obvious one would be harborage in the capital um because that's fully a a 25 percent reduction in the embark cost because 30 is 25 percent lower than 40. Uh, it demands one resident labor per year. <clears throat> what do we got in terms of resident labor available in the province? Uh, we have negative resident labor available. <laughs> okay, we need some emigration to the capital, please. God, the burger wage is, is high. These All these wages are high. It's a rich country. I mean, that makes sense. I'm going to go with um, two parallelism. We can, we can build it slow. That's fine. I should probably go with one, but... Come on, I want a return on my investment. I don't want it this century. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> Once again, hello, goodbye. Um, it's time for our first war post-unifying China. We're getting claims on lots of people, but the first one we're going to get is this province here. It's going to be a very small war, very contained. We just want to take one province so that I border via right here. Mongolistan, and then we can make Mongolistan a subject of ours, which will be useful because it means, and I can, I can afford to get plenty of generals here, um, it means that I will be able to, yeah, border Mongolistan, make them a tributary, whoops, I think I screwed that up, there we go, border Mongolistan, make them a tributary, and um, get more mandate by doing that which should be nice. We are also managing to um, establish some more tributaries around the place as we go, but I am going to take some more land from these guys before I, uh, before I allow them tributary status. But there we go. Quite a big war. Lots of people joined in, but I'm not scared. We are staggeringly populous. We found out we have 78 million people in the country, by the way. Pretty crazy. Eee, made a little error. <laughs> So we're doing this war. This war went fine, by the way. I took this province and now we're going to be able to uh, tributary Mongolistan. But we're sieging down Tumed, which is the remains of the broken Yuan. They, they shattered in a tribal war. I'm sure that's event driven. Um, and this is the city I wanted from them. It had some nice little infrastructure. And then I had one little misclick and I burnt it to the ground. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to do that. Um, but oh well. Oh well. <laughs> Bollocks. <laughs> that's uh it's inconvenient it's inconvenient is what that is we've also decided that these are the borders we're going to go for so that we can touch oira and therefore make them our um tributary as well but 
My bad. Okay, hear me out. I have a crazy idea. We need some higher education because as we get towards casual literacy, for example, you need a certain amount of knowledge production in a province to get it to invent. And then you also need a certain amount of knowledge production to actually get it to spread. So, how about we just go completely nuts? You can only open... Um, higher education industries in provinces that have certain things which I believe are higher education 10,000 urban pop how about if we just um, how about if we just try and open it everywhere what do you reckon <laughs> I think it's I think it's not a terrible idea how much is 10,000 urban population? I mean, do we just have that everywhere? I don't think so. I think we could do it. I think we could do it. I mean, it would open it in a lot of provinces, but then we're only going to invest in it in provinces where it's actually going to do something. Every village a college. Exactly. I'm tempted. Just to, because just, we just like... We have lots of money. Hey, China. Be smart. Boom. I mean... I mean, let's take a look. That, presumably that did open it in, in a, a ton of places. We're going to have a bunch of little... Okay, they already had it here, but... Does the auto-investor open... But see, we don't, we don't have it here. It's not everywhere. But there's going to be a lot of places where there's a new little higher education thing. I think... Uh, I think it's not, not the worst idea in the world, honestly. And it'll only grow in places where it's profitable. You know, in some of them, it'll just shrink and shrink and shrink and become minuscule and insignificant anyway. We should also think about where... Well, first off, where should I put these new merchants? One here, one here, one... Got one here. Can I trade with Bengal? Bengal attaches to... Kalinga? No, I don't think we can trade with them. Um... Let's, no, I don't know what to trade with. Let's just preemptively put him in Malaya. I haven't got anything better to do with them anyway. Um, yeah, they should close down where they're not needed. But what we should probably also do is try and open, I mean, you know what? While we're making bad decisions. You can only open certain industries in certain provinces. So why don't we just try and open them everywhere? <laughs> So, for example, is there anywhere that doesn't currently have a process material one? Oh, you can open that everywhere. Okay. Um, about... Like, where's the luxury one? Yeah, silk. How about Chinaware? It requires five urban development to open a Chinaware one. Okay, so where where has a Chinaware one? You can look at your cash to see how many you open. That's true. So this province, for example, no Chinaware. It kind of makes me sad. Because it's the largest province in the country. You could do a census to see domestic needs. Yeah, or... I could just open a Chinaware province in 200 divided by 5 <laughs> provinces. So 40. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, let's do some censuses. I'll do some censuses, YouTube, and come back to you with the results. Based on the census, I'm not convinced we need to open, but we opened 36 Chinawares. So, I mean, let's see how that works. This is part of why I wanted to play China. We have so much money, we can we can afford to throw it around. Hello, YouTube. Yet again, I have forgotten to take out, turn off the face cam. <laughs> All right. Thus marks the end of our initial period of warfare as Great Ming. We have established tributary states to the north, Seized some of the tribal land to create a nice buffer between us and the Oirat. We are establishing claims that will soon lead to us seizing some parts here. Um, and we are preparing our navy for an expedition round here. I'm going to go through the Shan states in order to get to India. Um, I think that's actually the shortest way rather than kind of hopping ports around um, here. So we're going we're gonna to cut straight through here basically and then own all this bit and then 
then conquer this peninsula. What's this peninsula called? Is this the Malay Peninsula? Even this bit? Because I know this is Malay, but I'm not sure. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so we're going to we're going to work with Korea. Unfortunately, the force tributary um, war goal does not allow you to force them to be your tributary. It's uh, it's forbidden under this war goal. So instead, holy hell, they have quite a bit of cash. Uh, let's take some of that. Um, we're instead just going to take some stuff to give us some prestige, so that the world gets over the fact that I keep killing my kids. <laughs> and then, yeah, claims, war goal, reparations, and then we're actually just going to have to conquer Korea basically instead. Uh, and how much how much money do we get in that war? I'm curious. We've also been uh, reforming away. Uh, in the meantime, we've got uh, higher salaries, which are really starting to cost a fair amount, 940 ducats on that. But as corruption comes down, our income is looking very, very healthy. Um, so that's always good. Burger reforms, we've got two of them done, up to level four. Um, but now now that our northern situation is kind of under control, we're still going to have to do some wars, I think, to, to force you to be my tributary, to force you to be my tributary to force Mongulistan to be my tributary. But once we've got those all locked down... Oh, and we've passed another uh, couple of reforms, by the way. We're getting up towards uh, towards cranking through these. Now we can turn our attention to India. What I'm going to do, basically, is just I want to break into the Indian market. The other thing I want to do is um, start conquer a bit of land in Japan. Just, just, just... Let, yeah, perfect. Let's take Nagasaki, and then we can use it as a foreign trading quarter, basically. It's going to be our ability to trade with uh, with Japan. Nice. How thematic. If you're not aware, during the um, various periods of the... I can't remember what it's called. The, the closed the closed nation period. There's a Japanese word that means... Clo or, or phrase that means closed nation or closed state or something like that. Uh, but when, when the Japanese weren't trading with outsiders, the one place you were allowed was the foreign quarter of Nagasaki, which is... Yeah, it's like here, I think. Um, but I guess it's probably accurate on the map. It's probably there. Um... To the Portuguese, and I think a tiny bit of the Spanish, a tiny, tiny bit of the British, but mostly the, Spanish, the Portuguese traded there. Sagoku, Sago, Sakoku is apparently the, uh, I'm probably butchering that, sorry, is the period I'm talking about. Um, Sengoku, Sengoku was after that, right? Anyway, we're going we're gonna to take a province of Japan so that we can trade with them, um, which will be good. We can sell all our newly made China to them and uh, cut across to India, but that is the plan in the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.